Hello, welcome. My name is Jodie Ginsberg. I'm the president of the Committee to Protect Journalists, and I'd like to welcome you to today's online panel on India's press freedom crisis. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really honoured at CPJ to convene this all women panel for this discussion on India's press freedom crisis ahead of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's scheduled visit to the United States next week and his meeting with President Biden on June 22nd. Since um, Prime Minister Modi came to power in 2014, CPJ has documented a worsening crackdown on India's media. Journalists critical of the government and Modi's BJP party have been jailed, harassed and surveyed in retaliation for their work. Six journalists, four from Indian administered Kashmir, are currently detained in India in retaliation for their work. All have been targeted under draconian security laws. But the crackdown doesn't stop with domestic media. The government has tightened its grip on the foreign media operating in India. In February, income tax authorities raided the BBC offices in Delhi and Mumbai following the government's censoring of the British broadcaster's critical documentary on the Prime Minister. Throughout the country, impunity reigns in the cases of killed Indian journalists. The murder trial of journalist Gary, Gary Lankesh didn't begin until last Ju July, nearly five years after she was reportedly shot dead by members of a criminal syndicate with links to Hindu right-wing groups. Authorities are yet to secure a single conviction in the case. Digital freedoms have also eroded during Modi's tenure. In April, the government enacted an amendment to the country's digital media rules requiring intermediaries, which include social media platforms, to remove content identified as fake or false by a government fact check entity, effectively empowering itself to be the sole arbiter of truth on the internet. CPJ has also documented a significant increase in online harassment faced by women journalists in recent years. CPJ found that at least 20 female Muslim journalists who have all reported critically on how the central BJP government's policies have threatened religious minorities, were listed for sale in a notorious auction app in January 22nd. Rana Ayub, a high-profile investigative journalist and Washington Post columnist, has long been subjected to online trolling and threats, including those of rape or murder, in relation to her reporting and commentary. And as we'll hear, unfortunately, she is by no means alone. Journalists who have critically reported on the government have also been targeted for surveillance, uh, and we've seen uh, frequent shutdowns of the internet across India. So in the wake of these disturbing attacks on press freedom and, and given the impending visit to the United States, I'm really pleased to have this panel of experts to discuss the issue and what we might do about it. I'm going to introduce each and then I'll start by asking them a question uh, and then move to the next panelist and then we'll have some follow up questions. And then after that, there'll be time for uh, Q&A. So if you have questions for any of the panelists, please do put them in, in the Q&A box. So Gita Seishu is a founding editor of the Free Speech Collective, an organization formed in 2018 to promote the rights to freedom of expression and dissent in India. An independent journalist and media analyst, Gita has reported on issues including media ethics and ownership, regulation of news television, digital access and online harassment of women and privacy. She is a member of UNESCO's Media Freedom Committee in India and previously served as a consulting editor for the media watchdog site, The Hoot. Gita, thank you for joining us. I've given a little flavor of the press freedom environment in India since Prime Minister Modi came to power in 2014, but could you flesh that out a little bit for us and tell us about the current environment? Thank you, uh, Jody. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak here and thank you, CPJ. Uh, very warm greetings to Anuradha and Shahina my very courageous colleagues and co-panelists. Uh, in the coming weeks, you'll, you know, you're going to hear a lot about India being the world's largest democracy. Uh, nowadays, we're also hearing about how India is ancient democratic traditions and is a mother of democracy. Now, for all of us journalists here in India, uh, we are well aware of how important press freedom is for a fun functioning democracy. Uh, but press freedom in India has always been rather tenuous, especially in areas facing intense political conflict, whether it's in Kashmir or the Northeast, as in, you know, we have an internet shutdown today in Manipur, 
in the Northeast or in Central India, and even in times of strife. Now, uh, journalists, to add to this, have been physically attacked or even killed when they cover crime, corruption, illegal activities. And I'll come to the impunity that shrouds these incidents a bit. Um, along with this, we've also begun to record an increase in attacks on freedom of expression for a range of citizens, uh, not just the media. So artists, writers, filmmakers, academics, students, cartoonists, stand-up comedians, and the average citizen who use social media platforms to post comments or share news or opinions. Um, now, these attacks are both physical as well as in the nature of legal complaints. And these are widespread, these are organized, and primarily from vigilante groups who owe allegiance to the right-wing Hindu nationalist ideology and groups associated with them. Now, these groups, which are often led by le local leaders of the Bharatiya Janata Party, have had free reign. Law enforcing agencies and the administration have done little to protect them from these organized mobs. And in all these cases, the process to secure justice is really punishing. It's long drawn, it's solitary, uh, it drains people of resources, financial and emotional. And of course, it has a chilling effect on the rest of society. So in 2014, the stage was already set for this kind of a downslide in press freedom. Uh, when I was with the Hoot, uh, we documented about 15 attacks on the media. And over the years, these attacks have got more and more vicious. Censorship has increased. Uh, we had uh, books that were pulped, like Wendy Doniger's book was pulped in 2014. Um, the year also saw the sharpest rise in hate speech uh, from barely two in 2012. And it peaked in the run up to the election, which was billed as one of the most divisive general elections in India's history. So today, by 2015, after five years of the BJP government in power, journalists have faced the worst brunt. Uh, we have a report, Getting Away with Murder, where we documented about 40 killings of journalists between 2014 and 2019. Of these, 21 were confirmed as relating to journalists. Um, and their work. Impunity has dogged all of these killings. There have been only three convictions. Uh, the failure of the justice delivery mechanisms is structural, but it's also political. Uh, the head of a religious order, Gurmeet Ram Rahim, who was convicted for the murder of a journalist and the rape of a devotee, he enjoys parole for extensive periods. Uh, the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, Yogi Adityanath, assumed office in 2017 and about 48 journalists were physically assaulted. During the uh, nationwide protest against the bill, the CANRC CA bill, several journalists on the field were attacked and harassed. And shamefully, uh, most of them were from the minority Muslim community. Uh, there's been a marked change in the government's engagement with the news media. By 2019, the pattern had set in. Prime Minister Modi's um, uh, attempt to engage with the media is extremely one-dimensional. It's unidirectional. Uh, he hasn't addressed a single press conference. His engagement with the media is extremely selective. they very carefully curated interviews with film, television personalities. Uh, he uses public broadcasting and government-funded media. The 100th episode of his Monkey Bath was broadcast recently, and it was made mandatory for over 400 community radio stations. And I don't know if you're aware that in India, community radio does not have permission to use to broadcast news. Private uh, radio channels can only carry news bulletins of the government's All India Radio. Uh, but despite that, of course, we are the largest democracy and we have a whole lot of media. We have over a lakh registered print publications. We have about 900 in odd privately owned television channels, half of which are news channels. So what the government does really in regulating and in dealing with all this media is, of course, the carrot and stick policy. And that's deployed in full measure. Uh, the government, the Indian government provides the 
most advertising revenue for the media. And the more partisan the media, the more favors it gets. And if media houses are still dissenting or publishing unpalatable news that can't be hidden, like the BBC uh, experience that we have, or the Hindi newspaper, Dainik Baskar, or the news portal, News Click, they are raided by a battery of investigative agencies. Enforcement Directorate, the Income Tax Department, the Central Bureau of Investigation, the National Investigation Agency, they're all made use of. And for journalists, lawfare is the government's weapon of choice. And in this arsenal, there's a host of laws. Uh, in Behind Bars, another study that we did on the arrest and detention of journalists in India, we found that the sharp rise in criminal cases lodged against journalists for, the work, for their work, a majority of these were in BJP rule states. And this has contributed to the deterioration in the climate for free speech in India. We Peter, have a range of laws. Yes, sorry, excuse sorry, me. I was just going to say, I, I want to come back to the, the question of this um, abuse of law in particular, but I think you hit on some, some really key um, points that we see actually reflect um, crackdowns on media in, in more authoritarian regimes, the setting of the tone from the top, the abuse of, of the media by those in power, which then sets the tone for, for those in, in more junior positions of authority, the use of money to control media, the abuse of regulation, and then the difficulty of achieving justice. And I think those are key points that we might want to draw out. It's interesting, I think, that you made the point at the beginning about India as a mother of democracy, the world's largest democracy. Someone made the point to me recently that that they felt that sometimes democracy was confused with the ability to hold elections, that democracy doesn't simply mean just being able to vote. It also means a raft of supporting pillars of which one is press freedom and that you can't call yourself a democracy simply because you have a large number of people voting and I think that's really key as we we go into this discussion so so I'll come back to you Gita thank you for that um let me turn to Anuradha Basin a journalist and peace activist who's extensively reported on politics conflict and human rights in Jammu and Kashmir she is executive editor of the Kashmir Times the old English daily in the region and her writings have appeared in various Indian and international publications, including the New York Times. And she's currently a John S. Knight Journalism Fellow at Stanford University. Welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, can you tell us about, in particular, the impact of the 2019 abrogation of Jammu and Kashmir's special autonomy status on press freedom in the region? We know that that the majority of journalists who are in prison at the moment in, in India are, are in prison because of their reporting either from or on the region. And I think it's really important to an outside world where we don't necessarily hear much about that specific um, issue, just to understand a little bit more detail, the specific issues that are arising there. Thank you, Jodi, and uh, thank you, uh, Geeta, for giving a overall view about what is happening in India. And I would say Kashmir is both a part of that landscape and a precursor to what is happening in India. Um, so particularly in Kashmir, journalism has always been very challenging and because of the nature of its uh, politics, of uh, the conflict, um, it has always been extremely challenging and there have been physical threats and journalists have been killed and detained and kidnapped. and. Um, in the last uh, 30, 40 years. But right now what we are dealing with post 2019 is an effective silence that has been imposed on journalists. Uh, there is gradually the in the last three, four years, reportage from Kashmir has reduced to a trickle. And now I think you rarely find reports uh, about Kashmir other than you know, about inane things or about tourism or development. And most of this is actually the government narrative, the official narrative, which is amplified by some of the embedded journalists without even asking questions about how uh, tourism is impacting, um, say, the ecology, uh, 
and uh, people and how what is the breakdown of development what uh, investment is coming in what is it being invested in where is the level of work um, reached uh, at at what uh, level is the is the uh, has the work been executed none of these questions are addressed in any of these reports these are just virtually like advertisements of the government and they are being uh, published and circulated in television in newspapers um and i'll come back to the local newspapers uh, later but right now there is silence because there is a climate of fear that has been imposed in kashmir uh, because extra judicial and coercive actions have been taken laws have been weaponized against journalists first we had the internet shut down which kind of exacerbated that climate of fear under which the journalists operated because for 6 months they were working out of a government kiosk where their entire work was under surveillance and it made it very difficult for them to operate and that instilled a sense of fear that refuses to go away because after that the government uh, started a policy of summoning uh, journalists to police stations for any critical story that they did even for a single critical word so summons to uh, police stations uh, for journalists which is now a routine and which is not legal but these are just verbal summons and journalists go because this is a conflict region and the most militarized region in the world so journalists are compelled to go to police station face grueling interrogation harassing questions uh they asked about their most uh private things including about family members and extended family uh their devices are confiscated monitored surveilled sometimes uh, tampered with and returned um and these are the challenges that they face if there are no summons there is at least a phone call which is intimidating enough and saying you know there will be consequences if you are reporting this if a journalist um asks any official for uh, an official quote he may uh, be to told that he shouldn't do that story and uh, that has this is actually killing uh, journalism or officials do not talk to uh, journalists making it very difficult for uh, journalists to authenticate their work um then uh, four journalists have been arrested i mean many more were detained and arrested for uh, short or long periods some as long as a year there are presently four journalists still in under detention and they have been um booked under criminal charges under anti terror laws um the most stringent provisions of the unlawful activities prevention act um and and the charges are often very vague uh they will be uh, you know whether criminal cases are slapped against them or anti terror laws are slapped against uh, journalists um for uh they would be booked for fake con content or for their social media posts and no specific content is sometimes mentioned it is as vague as that other than that they have been um anti terror raids on the houses and offices of journalists and newspapers uh and all this is in line with a jnk media policy that was unveiled in june 2020 and uh, which was introduced with the explicit aim of highlighting government's positive achievements and that's what it says it empowers a government official to decide what is fake news plagiarism and anti national and also recommend punitive action and it specifically states that its objective is to ensure a synchronized and effective use of all forms of media to build public trust foster a genuinely positive image of the government and that's really not the job of the of of the journalist that's the job of a publicity uh, department of the government um and so this gives 
power to the officials of the publicity relations department of the government to determine what is fake news and what is anti-national. So they become the judge, jury, and the arbiter. And they can also uh, suspend advertisements to newspapers who are not towing the line. And um, newspaper industry in Jammu and Kashmir for years has been heavily reliant on government advertising. So what this has done is, and, and even in previous uh, governments have often used advertising to arm twist uh, newspapers into towing a certain line. But right now it is just so much, uh, much more brazen post 2019 that um, not even a single critical word is tolerated. So either newspapers have shut down, they have scaled down their operation, or they're not saying much, or they are completely, they are doing great business, robust business, because they have agreed to turn their newspapers into um, virtually into uh, government uh, pamphlets and every day that newspapers come out they virtually look like uh, advertisements of the uh, the government uh, other than this um, there have been attempts to kill the solidarity spaces you know any kind of efforts to build organizations associations um, a notable example is the shutting down of the Kashmir Press Club in uh, January 2022. Um, journalists from Kashmir and particularly from Kashmir Valley, um, Kashmiri Muslims, have been put on no-fly lists and have been barred from traveling abroad, whether for their work, for collecting their awards and, you know, anything related to their profession. And today, it's not just a uh, issue of uh, for journalists. It's not just about physical threats, psychological threats. They're dealing with a lot of trauma. It's not just professional hazards. It's also about livelihood. Journalists in Kashmir are jobless. Many of them have shifted to other parts of um, India, and they cannot most of them cannot travel abroad um, and but they, there are no homes for their stories and so they're virtually jobless or they're doing odd jobs. Um, thank, thank you you paint a, a really um, alarming and dismal picture and I think what's really striking and we need to stress as you have is what happens when journalists cannot do their work either no information no information about how money is being spent how taxes are being spent what abuses of of individuals are occurring but also that then opens a space for an effective whitewashing you know a propaganda and i think you've painted a very powerful picture of the kind of propaganda machine that is operating um in the region in particular and i think it's something that we really need, need to focus on is this impact that the shutting down of media has on ordinary citizens and people and, and perhaps we can come back to that in a little while. I'm going to turn now to Shahina. Shahina KK is a senior editor for Outlook magazine and one of the first Indian journalists to be charged under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act that you've already heard about India's draconian anti-terror law. Shahina faces ongoing judicial harassment in a case opened nearly 13 years ago by the by the then BGP-led government in Karnataka state following her investigative report claiming that police had fabricated witness statements to arrest a suspect in connection with the 2008 bomb blast in Bangalore. Shahina, thank you for joining us. Um, I know it's difficult, but please tell us more about the charges you're personally battling and, and how that case has impacted your life and work as a journalist. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, yeah, as you said, uh, I don't know how to uh, share my experiences within five minutes, but I have to. Uh, uh, yeah, we were talking about uh, journalists uh, being booked under the Modi government uh, since 2014, but my case happened in 2010, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, I mean, I was booked by the police of the Karnataka state, which was under the BJP rule that time. 
as you mentioned, I traveled to Karnataka to do a story on a fabricated charge sheet by the Karnataka police. I exposed the charge sheet by interviewing the witnesses and they slapped this UAPA charges on me. Uh, as you may be knowing, this Unlawful Activities Prevention Act of 1967, uh, the objective of that act is uh, said to be, you know, to curb terrorism. But uh, or not only UAPA, but other acts, other laws like Sedition Law or Official Secret Act, such laws are being used to target journalists and activists and human rights defenders, writers, people like that. So um, especially this UAPA is widely used to uh, curb uh, activism, media freedom, things like that. And as you mentioned, I'm one of the first few people, uh, journalists who were booked under UAPA, maybe uh, because of that same reason that uh, when my case happened, it was the beginning and the courts and the judges were not that much used to uh, the kind of procedures and things. And, and uh, I mean, no, I don't know. I, I must say that I was lucky. I was lucky to get anticipatory bail after seven months of filing the case. Like for the first seven months of uh, me being framed up, I was uh, like, I was not in a position to stay at home because uh, like, I mean, there is a chance of being arrested. So I was like, you know, managing like, and my son was just four year old that time. And we were like, you know, running from one place to the other. And uh, within seven months, and I mean, like I got anticipatory bail. And after that, I was uh, asked to be present uh, before the investigating officer. And there was this very, very long process of interrogation. And uh, it took around 80 to 90 hours altogether, like, you know, from morning to evening. Uh, and this, the kind of interrogation is, you know, uh, I mean, only a person who went through it can understand what exactly uh, an interrogation is. Like, it's it was really, you know, you know, grilling and, you know, they did everything except touching your body, like all sorts of mental harassment, you know, and also... Uh, I, 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 I really learned one thing. Once you go through a process of interrogation, uh, it, they have this skill to put things on your mind and, you know, uh, you, 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 you might start contradicting yourself. I mean, I'm saying this to, to make you understand the kind of harassment, you know, that, uh, that I went through and also and in my case my uh, I I mean I had only one story to tell because I went there only to do my job I went there to report I went and went there to do a story so I had only one story I, I didn't have uh, multiple you know versions so I I, I I stuck to my story and I, I I could stick to that but still I tried to you know I, I tried to say something different only to save some people whom I met on met on the road, you know, met on the way, like, you know, I, I mean, like talking to somebody on the way, you know, and they were tracing everybody whom I met. So my attempt to save the people whom I met uh, ended up in chaos and, you know, they have all the evidence of whom I met and whom I talked to, whom I called. So it was like, and and now I really believe that even the police knows that it is nothing. I went there only to do my job and I was a bona fide journalist. I think the police knows it, but their mandate is to uh, book me because the other case, I mean, uh, my story was about the fabricated charge sheet against a person and that person and that charge sheet was politically very, very important for BJP in Karnataka. So they, di they didn't want me to uh, go. They didn't spare me. So that was the reason. It was it was really political. But I was the only person booked. My editor-in-chief, uh, Tarun Tejpal, he was not listed as one of the accused because, I mean, like, usually if the case is filed for the story, which I did, then the editor-in-chief should also be there in the list of the accused, but he was not there. I was the only person booked and, I mean, like, obviously, uh, there were a couple of other people who helped me in terms of translation because, uh, I mean, the state was Karnataka and 
it, they were speaking a different language. So I took uh, one person uh, for translating the stuff and he also was booked. So, and we all suffered, I mean, uh, the, all this harassments and uh, I mean, like it took all 13 years and still it's going on. Uh, the police took uh, more than two years to get me a certified copy of the translated documents of the case. Like they uh, prepared the charge sheet in their language in Canada. And I applied for a translated version and it took two years and more. And then after that, again, it took a uh, pretty long time to start the procedures and then I filed a discharge petition. Again, it took a long time and the for the, uh, you know, lower court to dismiss my uh, discharge petition. Then I filed the discharge petition in the high court and high court also dismissed and the Supreme Court didn't even admit my petition. Then now it's the time, time for trial. And now uh, in between a lot of changes happen, like there was a Supreme Court order which says that a case under UAPA cannot be tried by an ordinary trial court. It has to be tried by a special court, which is the court of NIA, National Investigation Agency. Only the NIA court can try such a case. So I, uh, up, applied for a transfer of my case to the NIA court. And now the transfer, transfer petition, I mean, actually the hearing on the transfer petition is done. It took almost one year and more than one year. And the uh, lower court uh, completed the hearing, but the judge uh, didn't uh, give me an order. He put it there on his table and now the judge is transferred. Now another judge came and my lawyer has to start everything afresh. Yeah, he can has to, a, sorry, yeah. can I ask you a question? Is this standard? I mean, this this lengthy 13 years for this to go from local court to a different court and back again and translations, that's an awfully long time to have that weighing. It must yeah. It must occupy your mind. You, you talked about having a four-year-old son who's now a, presumably a, a teenager. Like, is that is that normal? Kind of is that standard in India? Is this something that other journalists experience? Uh, uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, it's it's the standard in India. Like cases take uh, such a long time. Like there are a lot. I mean, I I don't know. I have not personally met a journalist who has been going through cases for more than uh, a decade or a couple of decades. But there are ordinary people who have been going through such cases, you know, for years and years and years. That's actually, a, you know, a standard in India. Uh, and also it, uh, on one side, maybe they, they, they are doing it deliberately too because they just want to drag it on because they know that there is no substance in the case. So they just want to drag it on until the other case is being closed. You know, in my case, as I mentioned, I did a story about the fabricated charge sheet against another person and that case is still going on. And so if the trial has not started in that case. Yeah, it's okay. interesting. yeah and I'm, I'm aware that... Um, I believe many of libel and defamation cases, which is another way of trying to silence journalists in, in India and elsewhere, often drag on for a similar period. I do want to move to a Q&A shortly. If you have questions, I, I know that there are a couple of people have sent questions in um, previously, um, but if you have questions, please do put them in the Q&A. So I'm going to go back to each of our panelists very quickly, and then we'll open up um, to conversation in about um, five minutes or so. So Gita, I want to come back to you to talk about digital media. And in particular, we know that um, India had the highest number of internet shutdowns um, for, the, for the past few years. This seems to be a technique to um, supposedly quell unrest, but obviously it has a huge impact on our ability to, to report and receive information. Can you just talk to us a little bit about the specific techniques used to throttle digital media in India currently? Uh, I think if we just heard what Jack Dorsey was saying uh, yesterday in uh, about the Indian government's pressure to take down accounts on Twitter, I think we get to see a fairly good 
uh, uh, get a fairly good sense of how the Indian media operates uh, with uh, digital uh, platforms. Uh, we have information from this RTI activist Venkatesh Nayak who said the Indian government issued over 3,417 orders to block Twitter URLs in 2022. Uh, in 2014, the number of such orders was only eight. So there is a very real threat of action against social media platforms. Uh, and, you know, this usually comes up in uh, flashpoint situations when there is a, uh, any kind of an agitation like the farmer's struggle or even what we are seeing in Manipur today. So uh, the government can crack down and we already know what happened in Kashmir when there was a complete communication shutdown. But apart from that, the government also uses law and they use the very repressive, very arbitrary sections of the Information Technology Act. I'll just give you two. Uh, one is the amendments to the Information Technology Intermediary Guidelines Digital Media Ethics Code, uh, which was in April, 2023, where the government said that a special fact-checking unit would be notified by the government to identify fake, false, misleading information. Now, none of this has been defined in any way and intermediaries are obliged not to publish them and they will have to take them down. So this is under challenge, of course, but uh, the government uh, has already decided the kind of uh, fact check unit that it would set up. Now, there is another uh, amendment to this uh, to these rules in October last year where intermediaries were legally obligated to prevent users from uploading harmful unlawful content and their failure to comply would make them lose their safe harbor provisions and there's also a grievance mechanism that has been set up and uh, uh, in, uh, digital media companies, websites, news sites, everybody has have to have a digital uh, grievance uh, officer. And then there's a three-tier uh, mechanism. But at the top of that is a government committee that can delete or modify content for preventing incitement to, the, to what they say would uh, relate to public order. Uh, surveillance again is, is at an all-time high in India and uh, there is absolutely no progress in investigation on surveillance of government uh, by government agencies on gov on journalists politicians activists who have used the uh, pegasus um, uh, you know by uh, the pegasus software uh, so uh, so essentially this is the way in which uh, the government uses the law uh, to shut down um, media uh, digital media, but the digital media companies are also unable to, either unable to or complicit in uh, this kind of censorship of content. That is actually very disturbing because many citizens find their content being taken down or their uh, accounts are blocked, whether it's on WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, or even on uh, Twitter and uh, have YouTube videos blocked. So there needs to be a greater pushback on this and we're not seeing it right now. And presumably the upcoming visit to the country in which many of these platforms are headquartered is an opportunity to raise some of these issues. I see we have a, a, a question. I'll, I'll come to that very um, shortly. I just want to give um, Anuradha a, a chance to, to expand a little bit on, on um, your comments on Kashmir. Um, I'm particularly, I suppose, interested in how the arrests are impacting the border community. And you've talked a little about this issue around solidarity. Solidarity is so key. Um, Kashmir is where we see the majority of arrests of journalists, of journalists remaining, remaining in jail. How has that impacted the border journalistic community? Yeah, massively. Um, I would say, uh, you know, Kashmir is a is a place where you've had a history of violence. You've had a history of a militarization, and so you arrest one or two journalists. Uh, that's 
enough to create a wider impact. Um, but other than that, it's not just the arrests. It's also time to time, repeatedly, almost every month, there would be raids on uh, certain, not just journalists, but activists, politicians, um, non-entities, and including journalists. So one or two journalists being roped in for, you know, anti-terror raids or anti-tax raids and, and, and things like that. But receiving phone calls or being called to police stations and being interrogated for the kind of work that they have done, and not just for the work, but then along with that, they ask them personal questions. Uh, they even harass them, they slap them, they abuse them. Uh, that kind of a regularity um, has, has, has instilled so much fear. Um, and especially in the last two years when they started arresting journalists, uh, more. I mean, Fahad Shah was arrested, uh, Sajjad Gul was arrested, another journalist, Manan, was already in jail at that time. Uh, Asif Sultan had been in jail since 2018. Um, that those arrests uh, with uh, multiple, and then they're, they're not arrested under one charge, under, in one case. Multiple cases are slapped against them so that they are unable to get bail. If, even if they get bail in one case, they cannot get bail in the other one and so, so that they remain in jail. Uh, and that, that, creates, uh, that, that creates absolute terror from fear to terror in the minds of the others who don't want to be arrested. And that, and then that, that then has uh, uh, an increased silencing effect. I want to talk about that silencing effect a little bit with, with you, Sheena, before we go to questions, because you write a lot about gender equality and women's rights, and we know that journalists from minority groups who, who write about these issues tend to be targeted, receive a, a, a really extraordinary level of abuse on social media. Can you just talk a little bit about um, the kinds of challenges facing journalists who write about these issues or from those communities? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, what I have been witnessing, uh, at least for the last uh, 14, 15 years in India, journalists uh, having uh, Muslim names, I mean, uh, they are their identity is reduced to uh, that of a Muslim. Uh, so, I mean, like, uh, and uh, I mean, like, as a person from this minority community, I have been facing uh, this everyday challenge in my profession when, I mean, like, uh, there is a lot of preoccupation from uh, people, like, you know, when I call up somebody, uh, when I say my name, I mean, like, in the state which I live in Kerala, I don't uh, have that issue because most of the people uh, know me. So I don't have that issue. But when I uh, talk to somebody uh, who don't know me, I, I feel that the kind of, you know, uh, preoccupation, prejudice that they have while uh, hearing my name. So this is actually, it has become a part of my life. Like I, 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 even now I started thinking, I mean, I stopped thinking about it. It's not a, you know, it's not even a problem for me, like, because it is so, you know, it's, it's so normalized uh, in my case. And, and even th there are occasions in which I don't get quotes, you know, I don't get quotes. Uh, uh, I mean, like people, people don't even say that, you know, I, I won't talk to you. Not like that, but people just simply don't talk to me. They, I have, I have gone through such experiences as well. This is not my own experience. I mean, there are other journalists whom I know uh, from the minority communities who also have been facing similar issues like, you know, and, 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 uh, uh, if they are people who are wearing, you know, things like hijab, you know, uh, wearing some religious, you know, stuff like hijab, then it's very, very difficult for them. Uh, this is something, I mean, even from the so-called progressive people, they, they, they face a kind of, they, they always have this taboo, like, you know, and also the comments like, she's a very smart uh, journalist, despite being a Muslim. See, 
that kind of comments also they have i mean like i i, I know a couple of my friends from the community and also i always have this experiences of being invited to uh, media seminars conferences but i always notice that i am the only person from the muslim community who is invited because i think i don't wear any you know any uh, you know any, any uh, things like hijab nothing like that so i am kind of a mainstream i hope you understand what i say and every time i tell them please call that person please call x please call y she is smarter than me she is more intelligent than me why are you not calling her only for the reason that she is wearing a hijab you know so these are the kind of experiences that we go through on an everyday basis and that puts extreme pressure on you as well if you have to then be the representative um of an entire community i uh, you know i i can only imagine how difficult that is i'm going to go to some questions we have a question in the q and a and then I, a couple of people sent in an advance which i'll get to but the the question is um we had large swathes of mainstream media in india that tow the government line spew hate speech and battle for ratings and keeping in mind the government's freedom of speech records um they're not going to regulate those those kind of positive narrative um, and the question is, how could those mainstream propaganda machines be reined in? Um, Gita, maybe I'll turn to you because you talked about this sort of propaganda machine, the use of advertising to skew. Um, how might the country think about um, balancing those narratives? Uh, you know, there are two issues here. One is that... Uh, Many of these, uh, you know, these mainstream media that uh, this uh, person is referring to are very powerful. And part of their power really is because of their proximity to the government. So they, uh, they get away with, literally get away with, uh, you know, screaming murder on uh, night after night. And it is, uh, there are very few actually who are, um, um, you know, who, who one can complain against or even have any sort of uh, uh, action taken against them. Now there are, uh, we have a self-regulatory mechanism, but it doesn't work really as effectively as it should. Because some of these media houses, some of these television channels don't even uh, comply with the uh, the, uh, the uh, punishment or the fine or, or you know, whatever has been meted out to them. So we have one television channel actually that is consistently been doing this, but this person, this uh, the editor and the owner of this television channel is hugely supported by the government and makes no bones about it. So really, uh, the government needs to take a much stronger line on hate speech because it is harmful it is hurting and it does incite violence but it's not happening it's really not happening what's happening actually is uh, interestingly is the public is rejecting this kind of media so during the farmer struggle for instance we found that when these uh, media uh, channels would go for uh, to cover something uh, the farmers, the protesting people would say, we don't want to speak to you. So there's actually a division and there's a very, very strong division because of which, uh, you know, these television channels then increase the temperature. They vilify uh, the protesting farmers or protesting people anywhere and continue with their propaganda. So ultimately, actually, the media is really losing its credibility completely with people. It's becoming delegitimized. And we have That's a government very, allowing that. That's very interesting that actually the thing that may cause the shift is that the readers themselves, the subscribers themselves. Um, we have another question here, which is, given the economic squeeze being placed on independent media, are raids on media houses being used to criminalize subscription models? I don't know who wants to take that. Anuradha. Yeah, you know, this is, 
on the one hand, we are already struggling the newspaper industry. Uh, there, there is a complete uh, change. And we are living in times when media as we understood it is changing because of a revolution of the digital technology as well. Um, so while on the one hand, it is difficult to maintain um, the revenues of the traditional media, which are still uh, the most uh, followed in uh, a place like India. I mean, people like, uh, there is, um, in terms of digital access, there is a lot, there are a lot of disparities within India. So there are areas which are not fully, um, you know, that there is not much digital access and social media, it does not reach out or uh, they cannot access websites and videos or download videos from YouTube to rely on their news feed. So they still rely on, uh, you know, newspapers which have a longer shelf life. Uh, but that may not, that, that's changing now with the new generation. So on the one hand, the newspaper industry is becoming, which is heavily reliant on the government advertising. Um, it's losing its ad advertisements. Um, newspapers uh, or, uh, you know, journalists are moving, editors are thinking of moving more towards the digital versions uh, or, and, um, and adopting that subscription models putting whether they're putting the content behind the paywall or not but membership models and subscription models but if there are going to be uh, you know if they're going to be charged with uh, accusations and allegations and cases that uh, subscription models can be used for uh, channelizing terror funding or some wrong funding i think that would be very very difficult and it, it's it's absurd uh, because these uh, kind of funding models are, they don't take huge sums of donations. These are just very small, uh, you know, membership fees, $20, $50, $100 maximum, maybe $1,000. Um, I don't see how, you know, this could be legally uh, be justifiable. But, um, you know, the charges are usually vague and wild. And it's to keep uh, the journalists out of circulation and 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 you know just smash them with a hammer. Um, Break charges is a, is a hallmark of a of a government that uh, or a regime that doesn't want to be criticised because vagueness is very difficult to to tackle. Um, we had a question earlier about international media facing restrictions about moving into Kashmir and being targeted by federal law enforcement. Um, and, and the question was, are there other pressures being put on? I think I'm just going to jump in very quickly to say, yes, we are seeing um, increasing queries around visa restrictions and particularly um, restricted access to places like Kashmir, which is really um, a disturbing trend. It's really important that governments are open not just to their domestic media but to international media as well um I want to we've only got a few minutes left and I want to make sure I ask each of you um for any of your last comments just just a minute or so on on any last comments you would like to make particularly in light of the upcoming visit and anything that you would hope um might be said or done as a result of that so um Gita let's start with you yeah I think the, the... What concerns us the most is that uh, there's a complete denial of accountability for any kind of news. Um, and this actually affects the kind of stories that journalists do want to tell. Uh, there are a number of stories that journalists ask, are writing, and there's some excellent journalism that comes out. Very good, solid investigative work on, on the health situation, on the food crises, on workers, on environment, on infrastructure projects that are displacing tons of people. None of this really comes out and none of this really gets the kind of impact it ought to have because the government just completely silences the media and disregards, dismisses these kinds of stories. So ultimately, you know, people are being robbed of their voice. And that is actually the biggest tragedy that we are seeing today. 
and allows corruption and an abuse of power, of course. Um, Anurata, what, what last comments would you like to leave us with? I mean, there are several things I want to take from uh, Geeta. You know, there are good journalists who are doing great stories, but they're not getting that much traction because most of the, the, the more powerful uh, mainstream media, which was the television or the, the broadsheet uh, print industry, they are being deplatformed. They, they've lost their jobs. The good journalists from there or have they moved out because their stories were not being carried and they're moving towards the alternate uh, news media or website uh, web, web portals or or you or relying on youtube channels and they're not getting that much traction and that is a sad state of affairs but other than that i think this whole criminalization of journalism is extremely threatening and and is silencing journalists even more um we need to be worried about that thank you shahina some last thoughts from you yeah actually uh, yeah actually uh i wanted to say the same point that raised by anuradha here uh the impact of this uh, chilling effect or the, you know this intimidating atmosphere in india is the kind of self-censorship imposed by journalists and media organizations. Uh, that's the, I mean, that we have to worry about that. I mean, if, I mean, not only on individual level, but uh, in organizations too, impose a lot of, uh, you know, restraint, a lot of self-censorship upon them. That's That's really, you know, tragic. Thank you all and thank you for taking the time to share with us your thoughts as you hear press freedom is under severe threat in India. It's very important we believe that press freedom is raised during the visit by Prime Minister Modi to the US next week um, and we hope we heard from our panelists that the Prime Minister does not do press conferences. We very much hope that he will take questions here uh, in the home of the First Amendment, where press freedom is such a pillar uh, and a crucial aspect of democracy, as press freedom is to fully democratic countries and states. Thank you um, all for taking the time to be with us today, and thank you for your attention. Um, have a great rest of day. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you.